His breakthrough bestseller is Joshua and the Shadow of Death. It tackles relevant real-world issues. National security, government contracts, and greed fuel this dramatic, quick read. McPherson's battle with Bichette's, thank you, I hope I practiced that well, as well as his own personal adoption story provide a unique perspective on the tale that explores suicide, separation anxiety, and blind rage syndrome. Joshua and his journey through the shadows encourage us to think about how we react to life's traumas. Please join me in welcoming Gary. Before I get started, I want to know, are there any Marine veterans in the room? I don't know. Okay. Today's their birthday, so that's why I ask. Two of my sons are Marines, our first and our third son are Marines. There's all I like to call my odd children. So, but today's a big deal for Marines. Um, so, I, I have to say, I'm as excited to hear what I'm going to say as maybe some of you. I have worked endlessly on this, uh, on this speech, on this message since I first heard I was coming. Um, it's been a very long time since I've been in this region of California. Uh, I grew up down yonder over the hill in Westminster, and that's, a, by the way, that's, that's my obligatory southern slang for the day. So, <laughs> just to let you know, although, where's Dwight? Um, see where he's at. Dwight told me, he says, he says, you've got an accent. I was like, no I don't, because <laughs> I, don't, I don't hear it. Um, anyway, so, I grew up, I did grow up down in Westminster. Uh, we moved when I was 17. Uh, uh, I was born in Sacramento, and we moved down to Westminster when I was three. My parents are from Virginia, from Mount Blacksburg. It's southwest Virginia. So when my father retired uh, from McDonald's Douglas Aerospace, we moved back east. So uh, that was interesting for me. Um, so how did I end up in Apple Valley <laughs> when I grew up down there? And the way I ended up here today, I want to introduce a couple people real quick. Benin, raise your hand, Benin. Benin and I went to school together, and thanks to Facebook, we managed to reconnect with a lot of classmates, including, including each other. And uh, yeah, I think Facebook put classmates out of business. Remember, the, remember um, classmates.com is they're pretty much out of business now. And next to her, holding the camera, is my wife, Donna McPherson. And she has a little tag on that said, hold it up so I can remember what it says. <laughs> author, author, emotional support, human. <laughs> so we went to a trade show this year down in Florida, and they handed those out to uh, basically people that brought their spouse, writers that brought their spouses. They, that was their ID tag. So yeah, we love that. So we, we carry that with us everywhere we go. So uh, getting back to what I said a moment ago, um, we moved uh, back when I was uh, after my sophomore year of high school. So I was 16, going on 17, and uh, moved to a big town called Clemens, North Carolina. So if you know, back in the 80s, I think Westminster was probably between around 80,000, 60 to 80, somewhere in there. And Clemens was 5,000 people. I mean, my high school was bigger. Yeah. <laughs> Westminster High School was bigger than Clemens. So that was different. Um, and uh, the first time I ever went on a date there, uh, it was when I was in the, when my junior year. I went out with this girl, and uh, she asked me how she looked. And I was still speaking very much uh, Californian at that time, and I was using a lot of jargon back from 1982 <laughs> at that time. So I used the word totally, and I won't say the other word, but I found out it could be offensive to some women. And I found that out because I had a handprint <laughs> on the side of my hand. So I learned two things in that moment. First, I had to change my vernacular. The second one was I don't like pain. <laughs> and that's kind of a shame because I grew up in pain. So to go back to, uh, to sort of my story, uh, when I was born, uh, I was put for adoption and my parents adopted me at three weeks old. And fortunately for me, at nine weeks old, um, and my mom tells me the story because for some reason I don't remember it. Um, <laughs> I had sores come into my mouth, my throat, and I couldn't, I couldn't eat. I couldn't take a bottle. And the doctors, this is 66, 
The doc doctors had no idea. All right, they, I mean, back then, they had no clue. And since I was adopted, and as I've learned since then, my, my mother either couldn't or, or uh, wouldn't say who the father was. She, she had some, she, she was a very loving person to do what she did put me up for adoption. And so the doctors came up with all sorts of theories based on her suspected background, and they were all wrong. And then they looked at things like thrush, and that didn't, that wasn't it, those treatments didn't work. And the sores went away, sort of magically, you could say, uh, in a couple weeks, and then they'd return, like a couple weeks later, and then back and forth, back and forth. And then it got a little more serious, and uh, I had, um, my white blood cell count spiked, and it went higher than my red blood cell count. So then they were telling my parents, well, maybe it's leukemia or cancer. I mean, I tell my mom all the time that I'm a father and grandfather. I'm like, I don't know how she did it. I'm like, I, I wouldn't take me back and, and like, <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea how she did it. She's amazing, and my dad, they were, they were amazing. <laughs> and so uh, that was kind of how life started for me. And it, and it stayed that way, and probably the peak of my childhood years, I don't know if anybody remembers back around 79 or 80, the Asian flu, when it came through. Yeah. And I caught that. And uh, I spiked a fever of 110, Whoa. which yeah. is a little unusual and also very dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. And what I remember, to give you an idea of what was going on, what I remember at that time was uh, me sitting in a bathtub at home and mom, and a, a bathtub of ice at home, and my mom pouring water, cold water on me and crying. What really happened, I was in the hospital, and it was a nurse that was pouring rubbing alcohol over me in an ice bath to get the fever down. Like I said, my mom, God, strong woman. Anyway, <laughs> there's no way I'd do it. Um, but I mean, they, they were committed. Uh, they, they stayed committed. We, we lost dad in 2012. Mom's still with us and lives, doesn't live too far from me. And so that was life for me until, um, and I'm going to jump way ahead now, because that was pretty much life until 2010. 2010, uh, I was working as an IT manager for Bank of America at our corporate headquarters in Charlotte. I'd been in IT at that time since 92. I started out at Microsoft. They were actually, not too many people know, they actually had a campus in Charlotte. And um, I, by that point, the disease had kind of caught up to me. And so I ended up on disability in 2010. And I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I mean, I was in my 40s. <laughs> it's like math, it's hard when it's your age. Um, and yeah, once you pass 40, once you pass 40, you're like, I don't care. You know? So it was, it was before 50. Uh, but I was young, I mean, still relatively young. And so Don and I talked about it. And at the time, I used to write off and on just kind of for fun. and. Uh, Nothing serious. And Don at the time said, why didn't you write? And, and I was kind of wavering on it because I had done some technical stuff, some technical bugs and whatnot in my career, but I had never like written what I would consider writing and publishing your own book. And so I started touring around with the idea and I thought about writing a book about my disease because there's only 25,000 people in the U.S. with it. Interesting, uh, this part's kind of funny, funny interesting, at least to me. Um, my birth mother, immigrated from Denmark with her family. So I'm, I'm half Danish, which always, I was so excited to find out, I'm like, who's half anything? So I was all excited, I was like, I'm half of something. <laughs> That's not where the disease comes from. The biological father, we don't know exactly uh, any of its history, but we know some of the genetics because we did some genetic testing in the 90s. And there is a, a gene common to people with Pichette. You can have the gene and not get the disease, but everybody with the disease that has what's called the, what they call the Asian strain of Pichette's uh, has this gene. And what my doctor told me, he, what percentage, you know, who knows, but he, he was from uh, the Middle East, Turkey or Armenian region. So he's the guy that gave me the problem. <laughs> it was my mother, it was, it was the dude. Um, and so, with, uh, so I had kind of a, I, you know, I was looking at that and I was like, this story is so kind of weird, even though it's true. I was like, who's really going to relate to it necessarily? Right? And I've had some friends that have gone through cancer and some other things. And I've been surprised at how much they say some of my battles have related to what they've gone through. 
But I didn't feel like, I, I was like, there'd be one book, and I told Donna at the time, I said, I don't want to commit to just one book. I just, I want to do more than that. If I'm going to write, I want to, like, write. So I decided to go with fiction. And as I start, I start studying the Danish history, because McPherson, shocker, uh, Scottish, so <laughs> I hate Scotland, and my, my parents are Scotch-German, so I knew all that history. And uh, that's kind of my regular joke, by the way, I tell people all the time, yeah, I was raised by Scotch-German parents, I'm half, Tur half uh, Danish, and paternally I'm Turkish. I said, so I'm, I'm really looking for a country to take over. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, I mean, kind of, so no wonder I have two kids that are Marines. Um, so, anyway, I just lost my place. Anyway, anyway, so I got to thinking about it, and I was like, okay, well, I'm just, I was thinking about the book and what I wanted to do, and I really hadn't come up with anything, and I was looking at the history of my biological mother, because, I, because there's so few of us, I actually do a lot of research and take it to my doctors, because they don't have time. It's uh, an autoimmune disease which falls under rheumatology. Lots of things fall under rheumatology. I don't know how many people realize that AIDS follows under rheumatology because it's an autoimmune disease. And so um, I was researching the Danish uh, just to see if there could be something that they missed. And I came across the berserkers. And the berserkers intrigued me because it's sort of like seeing y'all and yonder and other things. Uh, Everyone, at some point or another, it, you probably have said it, maybe, maybe thought about it, maybe not. You know, you'll say, so-and-so has gone berserk, or there's an acting berserk. That's based on these guys. So, uh, there's sort of legend in history, and they existed. We know they existed during the Viking Age, and there were actually two groups. There was the, the Danish, and there were the Swedish, and, and they were different in how they dressed, how they identified, and even how they fought. Uh, there's some subtle differences as far as the stories between the two. Um, but I started looking at it and I was like, you know, and this is kind of how my mind works. I thought, wouldn't it be cool if you had two half-brothers and they were orphans, one gets adopted, and they have this, they're berserkers, but they don't know it, right? And it's now, it's the modern, it's now. And nobody's looking for this, and it's in America, so they're not looking for it. And they're trying to figure out why they have, they go into this, not just a rage, but just, you know, where you're like, you're superhuman almost rage, right? As I tell people, I said, I wanted to be careful not to make this some sort of superhero book, because I don't, I, that's not what this is. But I wanted to capture the, the essence of, of the legend, if you will. And so I came up with the Berserker series. And the first book that I had at the time, this is 2010, I had in mind was called Bill, or actually it was the Berserker, and then Bill the Berserker, because I was playing with titles. And the reason I called it Bill is my middle name is William. So I was like, ah, that, that'll be fun. It's <laughs> obvious. Um, and in 2012, uh, I went through some well, non-traditional, I guess you could call well, traditional, it's just not done anymore, physical therapy, because of the pain level causes. And um, I was able to go back to work. So my, my wife's best friend is a physical therapist, and as I told her, I would have never done it in her, because I wouldn't have trusted her. Basically, real quick, um, the skin and muscle have what's called fascia between them. That's what allows you to bend and move. Well, because of uh, the bichettes, and, and over the time the bichettes has transformed or morphed into fibromyalgia, fibromatosis, and other things, where the COVID immune system has been attacking and scarring and all the rest of it. And so the way we fixed it is she did what was called skin rolls, where they basically they rip the skin and the, and the fascia and the muscle and tear that and get it loose again. So I said, I've been through a lot of things, including like eye injections, when I had, when I was going, when I was going blind at one point. This was the worst. I cried. I never, she could, I never cried. I bawled my eyes out. I was laying on the table. It was bad. But if I, but I trusted her friend. And as a result, I went back to work. Well, in 2017, which last year, uh, Bank of America went through a, a, a massive reorg, which they often do, and they cut 75 positions. And for some reason, I'm sure it was coincidence, they cut 75 of the senior, more senior application managers, which I was one. And at that point, I had an option. I could, uh, we talked about it. I could go back and try to go back to work. And the way corporations is not just BMA. 
a lot of corporations do this now. The practice is, instead of doing a reorganization and moving people around, if you have people that are more senior and cost more money because they've been there a long time, they cut your position, then you can reapply, and you'll find positions very similar to the one you used to have for about 20% less money. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and so I was like, and if I had been healthy, I probably would have done it. Because at, the, at this point, our kids are grown, and I was like, well, even that was a good salary, which is the two of us, and Donna works uh, teaching music now. And so, you know, I was like, we could take the hit. But physically, I had been working from home since, uh, the end of 2012, and by that point, I couldn't, there was no way I could go back to work, not in an office, which is what they wanted. And we, I looked at other options, but at the end of the day, I, I can, and this good, gets into my writing, I can work about two hours a day productively. When I'm writing, if I'm writing my first draft, I can write for about two hours for three days, and then I have to take a day or two off, which, because I know you guys write, is maddening. Right, especially if you're doing a, a story, you're like, you're, you're going and it's running in your head and you want to get it out and you're like, I can't, my hand won't work. So, and if anyone, if people usually ask me what about voice recognition, and I've been playing voice recognition for at least half a decade. No. <laughs> it's awful. I tell people, I said, it's not up to about 98% accurate, but that 2%, it, when it's wrong, it is so wrong. This last book that I'm on is the second book, the second book in the series is now in beta. But with the beta readers, I'm sorry, I, that's software. I'm so used to still talking software. But it's with the beta readers. When I went through and uh, did some self editing, there were paragraphs. I was like, what did I do? What? I have no idea what I'm even saying here. So, yeah, you just, you really can't. So, but where we were at that point, I realized I can go back to work. I went ahead and applied for Social Security Disability. And, um, and right now my random joke is I have I have I already have the first novel published in the series. I got the second one coming out. I'm still waiting here. <laughs> it's, it's been a year. We say tell me it's a good thing. So that's a good sign. So I'm like okay. Um, and and I, I told the message. I told my doctors my goal is to sell enough books that I can just call them up and say you know never mind. Um, I did that the first time when I was on disability the first time. I called them. I was like I'm going back to work and they were shocked. You're going back to work? No one does that. So I'd rather work. I'd rather, as I tell people, I'm 52. I'd rather be donating into Social Security than pulling out right now. So, anyway, so that's when we decided. Donna and I talked, and she was like, "You should go back into. You should. You should write that book. You should finish the book." And I was scared because I want like writing. First of all, changing careers at 52. Um, I swore I would never do that. I was like, I am not a midlife crisis guy. I love my, even even with the headaches and the drama. I love my job. I loved IT. I loved everything about computers. I was like, I'm not I'm not that guy. And as we looked at everything, we realized, well, I can't do that anymore. So I have a choice. I can do nothing, which that's not me, or I could create. And I'm like, how am I going to create? And I was like, it's it's really pushing. Me. I'm really heading that direction. So as I tell people, I said that the defining moment, we were standing on a boardwalk in Myr Myrtle Beach and uh, looking out over the water and uh, get this guy, we were, I just don't remember the whole scene. And I just looked at her, I was like, are you sure? And she said, yes. I was like, are you really sure? And she said, yes. And I said, okay, well, don't get used to vacations. <laughs> I was like, this is the last one for a while. Um, so I started writing, I went back. Uh, to, to the series. And by this time, of course, I've been through a lot more with my disease. And I, I looked at the stories of what I had originally intended. And originally I intended to be a story about the two half-brothers, and it was going to be a protagonist and antagonist. <coughs> and the older half-brother was the result of um, uh, an incestuous rape. And, and, and the idea behind it was because he would, be, he would have more of the genetic imprint. And then the, the other half brother would be through just a normal relationship. And as I wrote the story out, I wanted to make the, the antagonist kind of likable. Well, the more I wrote him, the more I liked him. And pretty soon I was like, I can't hate this guy. And so I was like, well, darn, now I can do two books. <laughs> and then I got into, so I was looking at both books, trying to figure out how I was going to do this uh, star series with two books. And I started looking at the book that's over there now, Joshua and the Shadow of Death. 
And Joshua is the, uh, he's a psychoanalyst, childhood development specialist. That's a mouthful. Basically, he was the guy at the orphanage that took care of Bill. He was the guy that treated Bill for, for his, and Joshua calls it the berserker syndrome. And he does it based on the symptoms, not knowing these guys really are berserkers. And so, uh, as I wrote his character out, I realized he would come into the scene. I'm like, he's really kind of mysterious. And if I don't give some sort of background, no one's going to, you know, it's not going to really make sense. And as I start working on Joshua, I realized Joshua has a lot to add. If I write a book about Joshua, it's going to add so much to this series. And it kind of was good for me because I looked at that and I said, well, if, if I could take a minute and like sort of step out of me and turn around and look at me like the doctor, that's Joshua. Right? So I tell the story that the first book is about these boys and this condition they have is, as from the perspective of the doctor. So it's, it's all the books. So I, and I like, this is my style of writing. I like writing third person limited view. And I always tell people, I said, just think of like the main character has a GoPro on their chest and that's pretty much, that's pretty much it. One, and I'll be frank, it's easier, right? It's a lot easier to, to contain your character. It's a lot easier to control a scene when you're limited to just the one, the, you're viewing it as one person and it's that consistent throughout the book. It's also easier to track the characters and everything else. And it's great because you only know what the one character knows. So for me, myself, I like thriller and suspense, that type of book. And so if you're limited, what that person sees, that, I mean, honestly, that makes that, that much easier, right? Because you can have things going on over here that, that the character doesn't know about, neither does your reader. And then, uh, you know, he basically stumbled upon something. So you can do all kinds of twists and turns and, and everything else. And it's, a, it's, to me, it's a lot of fun. And so that's why I love writing that way. And so Joshua is written literally from Joshua's perspective. And the series, this book alone, this was probably the hardest book to write, not just because it's from the outside looking in, but also because part of it, as they mentioned in, uh, up front, and as I've been talking about, I try to relate Bichette's to this Berserker Syndrome, and I try to make it relatable so that people can kind of understand or get into the head of what's it like to have something that you can't identify with, and but it messes up your life, and you, you know, you have to learn to live with it, right? You have a couple choices. One is you gotta learn to live with it. The other choice is you don't, and that's bad, really bad things happen there. So, in Joshua, he doesn't have Berserker Syndrome, so I had to do something else, and I grabbed that for my life as well. So, I always tell people, I always like to clarify this, Richard, who is, who is Harold's father, Harold's the one that's adopted, he's the older brother, he gets adopted. His father, Richard, is actually modeled after my dad. So, my late dad, um, he was a pretty amazing guy. So, he grew up on a farm in Blacksburg, Virginia, went into the Air Force, went over to, uh, was based in Germany and the UK, uh, he went over there in 1950, came back, and went to college, and then moved to California, Back when you could get away with this, no job, no nothing, right? They just came, he'd been in, based out here in the Air Force, loved the state, did like everyone else, said, you know, this is why you have houses of $900,000 for one bedroom. <laughs> he moved out here. And uh, he went for, to work for Douglas Aircraft, ended up at Donald Douglas working as a rocket engineer. And then he retired <coughs> later. And so, this, so Richard in this book, in Joshua, is a defense contractor. He owns a defense company. And the reason I chose defense is my dad used to bring me into his office and not only show me stuff about rockets, but they all, McDonnell Douglas, like now Boeing, right, does a lot of defense. And it was real cool as a teenager because he'd bring me in and he had these classified papers. And he would be like, you can read this, but you can't tell anyone. And then, to me, that was awesome. Yeah. Right? I was like, I had the best life ever. I was like, this is so great. I know all these secrets, national secrets. So I, I leveraged that. For, for this book. But unlike my dad, Richard kills himself. And this is not a spoiler, it's at the front of the book, it's in the back of the book on the, on the jacket. Richard kills himself. And I always like to say, my dad died of a heart attack. Because it's like, I don't want people, I've had a couple people like, kind of look at me like, did he? I'm like, no, no, no he didn't, mm -hmm. no. But, <laughs> so, that's how I got sort of pulled myself in, put myself into Joshua. 
was I went through, I took chapter one in particular, the emotions Joshua goes through, the family goes through, is very similar to the day I lost my dad. I was with him in the trauma room when it happened. And so, that part of the book I was able to pull from my life. And then the other parts of the book, and the series itself, I wanted to do more than just give an allegory, if you will, or uh, pochettes. I, I really wanted to, to have it mean more than something medical. So the underlying theme throughout all the books, and it's more than a trilogy, there's just three, one published and, and two more coming. There's a fourth one I already know I'm getting right. Um, and there's a fourth that I'll talk about her day, the fourth character. But um, I wanted an underlying theme that people could relate to. And this is, uh, I came up with this actually in 2010. And the under, and it's kind of timely. Uh, it blows my mind on the timing of it because it wasn't planned. The underlying theme is forgiveness, which I'm like, man, do we need it. Um, and so I cover, it, and the reason I chose that is when I went through uh, the loss of my father, at the time, my Donna was in ICU. And she had some complications from a surgery. And the doctor had messed up. And so I was kind of enraged. <laughs> Go figure. And I went and I, uh, I uh, went to, they, long story short, they sent me to a psychologist. And she really pushed the idea, the idea of forgiveness, which is kind of ironic since I go to church, but she really pushed the idea of forgiveness from a psychological point of view. And that's what I wanted to put in the book, which is the idea is when you forgive, you don't let the other people or situation off the hook. You're, help, you're helping yourself. It's all about really us, right? It's healthy for us. And so in, uh, in Joshua in the series, the underlying series is uh, the forgiveness of what happens when you do when you don't. And, and the antagonist and the protagonist, you go through these stories and you see that it doesn't necessarily change your situation or the person, but uh, it changes your perspective as you go forward. And it's not in any way, shape, or form like a, a corny kind of ending or anything else. It's, yeah, it's a, well, it's a series. Uh, <laughs> there's a reason it's a series. But kind of, that was what I was really trying to get through on the other current of it. And so that's, uh, I mean, that's basically how I came up with, um, with the series. Now, a couple other things on the writing. So one of the reasons I did this this way, I took uh, Ted Decker, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Ted Decker, He's an author, and he has a writing course called The Creative Way. And that is the writing course I took last year uh, when I decided to write, because I, I was like, I'm an IT guy. I'm like, I gotta take some, some sort of classes. And I didn't, with my health, I couldn't go do, I couldn't take a college class, because I can't work on a strict schedule. So I took this course, it was really good. But one of the things he brings up, which I think is, is really important, is you know being genuine in your writing, right? And, and and being genuine is in the way he turned, the way he gave the example, is we do put a little bit of ourselves in every book that we write. Whether it's fiction or nonfiction, we do put some of ourselves in there. If we don't, we're not really doing a good job, honestly. He, as he put it, he said, if you don't laugh and cry if you're writing fiction, for example, he's like, if you're not laughing and crying at the keyboard, you need to go back and rewrite it. Right? When I wrote chapter one of Joshua, um, Don, and this was the first draft, which is very different from the way it is now, but uh, in, in part. But I handed it to her, I said, read this, let me know, because she's much better at the mechanics of English than I am. So, um, oh, by the way, thank you for being an editor. I love editors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I hear other writers talk about they hate their editors. I'm like, no, 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 I don't like editors. Um, they save me from so many mistakes. Um, but I had to read it, and I come out, and I said, well, what'd you think? And her eyes are all watery. She's like, you made me cry. <laughs> And I went dancing back in my office. <laughs> I did it. So, so it is important that we put, you know, we're honest in our writing. And, and that was what I really wanted to get into my writing. Um, and Brian and I were talking about this a little bit earlier. Some of the other books I'm working on beyond the series. I was telling him, we have a woman that we're friends with who started a, a ministry in Charlotte that uh, rescues women of uh, human trafficking. Charlotte's actually one of the worst cities 
uh, for that because of the way it's looked. We're looking on two uh, interstates, one coming out of Atlanta and then uh, heading up north and then going east to west. And in addition to the airport and our sports teams, actually it's, it's pretty common to find this kind of problem where you have big sporting events. And I talked to her and I plan to do two novel series on human trafficking with her help and with the help of a couple of women who will be anonymous. Um, and so those are the things I like to write about. And, and that would be a little more challenging because, right, I mean, I'm not, I'm not in human trafficking. So, uh, but, but there's still things you can put in there I can put in there, right? So in any case, uh, that's, how, that's how I write, and that's how um, I really came about this series. And, and it's really kind of neat for me that something that was so horrible, and uh, I'll be honest, the shit is horrible. Um, we were kind of able to turn it on its head and turn it into something really good. Uh, and the same with uh, the adoption. Um, my birth mother, uh, I found out, I, I tried to reach out to her. I was adopted through the California Children's Home Society, which is a great organization. I love it. And they helped me track her down. She died six months before I found her. So, um, but I have some half siblings out there. And they did not want contact, which was okay. But the caseworker went to the went the extra mile to basically be an intermediary. And that's how I got all my birth mother's medical history and her, her family about the him immigrating to America and all the rest of it came from those half siblings. So the Children's Home Society was great. I mean they were amazing for that. So the fourth book that will be written probably after the ones for human trafficking because I really want to get those out. It's actually going to be about her, just based on what the little I know about her, the rest will be very much creative license. But that will, and it will continue the same series and theme and, and whatnot. Uh, but in any case, that's, I mean, that's, that's me. That's, uh, you know, how, how I use uh, what I have to, to write my books. So, um, Gary, we're going to go ahead and take a short break, and then you guys have a chance to actually meet Gary over here and look at his books and purchase some of those. Then we'll get back for Q and A afterwards. All right, all right. Thank you all. We'll take a see in Spring Valley Lake for lunch. You are welcome to join them. Um, so it's something that's special on there. Um, and also we have uh, drawings, so make sure you have your tickets after we're done with our Q&A. We have actually five prizes for you today, you lucky people. So somebody's guaranteed to win. Your odds are great. It's perfect. So I'm going to have Gary, if you don't mind, coming back up. And I'm going to sort of meander through the crowd and see about our questions and answers, and I'll go from there. Yes. Okay. So for my editors, could you repeat the question, please? Oh, yes. How did I find my editors? So the way I did it, and part of the, some of the things that I do, I'm able to do uh, based on my IT background. I was a, a data warehouse uh, developer and manager, and so I'm really good at searching for things. I I was doing stuff that Google, we, we were doing stuff, I should say, back in the 90s that Google's doing now. So a lot of people, a lot of the, like my editors, that I was able to find, I was able to find fairly easily because of, of knowing how to, to get Google and, and, and how to pull information out of that system. But for me, um, there's a group of editors, and if you go up, I, 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 and I was trying to remember the name of the, the organization, first I haven't had time to look it up, but there's a, there's a seal for independent editors. And these editors, the reason that seal is important is they work with publishing houses as well as uh, individual uh, authors. And for my editors, I have one, uh, Dream Raven uh, editing, 
is my primary editor. She's terrific. I, I love her to death. Her name's Amanda. And I also have another one who's an independent editor. Uh, and I, unfortunately, I don't know the name of her company right now, but both of them have done work for Harper Collins. And uh, oh, what was the other? I can't remember the other one. I always do this. <laughs> that was always easy to remember because I've actually run into quite a few writers from, from that publishing house. But a couple of other publishing houses as well. So that's where I find my editor, where I found my editors. And uh, for me personally, I think that was probably a, a really good route because there's a lot of people on the on the internet. <laughs> some are good, some not so good. Uh, and so you know, you really have to kind of flesh it out. And so that was for me, that was a good way to flesh out my editors because I knew they had. A, I went. You could look up their resume. You know, and they were on LinkedIn too. I mean, that was another good thing. I went up on LinkedIn and looked them up, and they were there, and I could see their background and history and what they had done versus picking Could you, uh, when you get home, could you share the name of that editing group? Yes, definitely. With our president, so she can let us know. Absolutely. <clears throat> yes. Could you repeat that, please? She asked if I could share the name of the independent editing group, and I, yeah, I can do that. Holly? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Um, as a writer who needs an editor, um, how were you able to discern who was good? Because my concern has always been, like you said, there are a lot of people out there, and you don't know how good their advice is. And if you're someone who needs an editor, how do you tell? <laughs> Does that make sense? That's a good question. How do I, find, how do I determine a good editor? Um, you learn from your mistakes. <laughs> so I did a couple things. One was, I, I did a lot of self-editing to begin with, and uh, I, I exploited my wife, who's a really good editor, and we kind of bounced it between us. And then um, we had someone who was fairly new to writing do an edit, and then I read through after her edits to see what was left. And then from that point, I started looking, kind of doing deeper dives into uh, specific editors and then I started doing the background lookups. Like I said, LinkedIn was a great, is a great resource because most people, they have a, a, their own business, they're going to be on LinkedIn no matter what the discipline. And so I started looking through there and then this certification that I need to, to give to you guys, I came across that with my editor and it was sort of funny, I had like four editors lined up, I had them sort of bidding against each other to some extent. And the editor I'm with now, her counterpart was the one that, that informed me about the certification. Because she said, I hate to admit this. <laughs> she, said, she said, but the certification's a big deal. Because she didn't even have it. She had the background, but she didn't have the certification. And she said, you know, that's actually a really big deal. And if I were you, because she was a little less expensive, she said, I would go with her. And which was great advice. And she, I mean, she's been terrific. So. Other questions you guys want to hear? Yes, Bob? Uh, I think in your bio you said uh, you were 32 years old before you found uh, you had this condition. Yeah. And can you tell us a little about that? Yeah, that's a good question. It's something that's actually something that we can Okay, I, I just a moment. Let's repeat the question one sure. more time. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, basically, how did they figure out at 30, when I was 32 years old that I had the chest disease? So the way that came about, I was going, I woke up one day and I couldn't see part of the bedroom. I was going blind. And by the time, I mean, by the time I went to the doctor, because it was one of those things where at first I thought it was just tired eyes, because, I mean, in, when, you're, when you're in computers, you're always staring at a screen, you're doing long hours. And so by the time I got into the doctor, I really couldn't see much of anything out of the left eye. And they did a bunch of tests on me and found out I had uveitis, which is also a rare disease to see in America. And they started doing my medical history. And then they started taking more blood. At one point I told them, why didn't they take a pint? They just kept pulling blood. It was ridiculous. And because of the medical history and the blood work and whatnot, that's how they were able to determine I had Bichette's. Now what's kind of cool when I had, had didn't mention, mention this earlier, didn't share this earlier, is my, I, I, went, I, I was legally blind at one point. I also drove to work, which I don't, now that I don't, now that I don't, now that I'm, I always tell people that's like, oh. I'm like, yeah, I was like, I was like, it was to me, it was like watching an EGA screen on the computer. It was like, you see the blocks, the black blocks of roads, the blocks of car. Just, I know, it sounds crazy, but it worked. Um, yeah, it's like things you don't know about the drivers around you, right? It's like, and, um, but 
but my retinas were bleeding. And the doctor told me, he said, you have two weeks and everything's going to go black. I mean, it was legally blind, but there's legally blind as far as acuity, and then there's like, your work goes black, you don't see light or anything. Because the retinas were bleeding and blood on the retina, that's it. And two weeks later, I went back in, my eyes felt, and, oh, I need that. and at the time, a light like this light would have killed me. I would always wear sunglasses because the light was just painful. I went back in two weeks, the pain was gone, and I could see. And I was like, well, this is weird. And I went in, and it was so funny because the doctor was kind of upset. He goes, I don't get this. He's reading over his nose. I'm like, what is it? He said, your retinas are fine now. And I was like, okay, this is good. So why you went out? He said, no, you don't get it. He said, they were bleeding. You should have scarring. He said, they're not just like, okay. They're like brand new. Like, seriously, like infant wow. style brand new retinas. To this day, my retinas are younger than me. So, yeah, that's kind of... It's officially written in, in the medical records as self-regenerating redness. That's how they document it. Is that a question? Is that a question? Is that a No, that's a miracle. <laughs> it's a straight-up miracle. Yeah. Is it related to the other? Are they real? Is it related? Yes. All that. So with the uveitis, it's the immune system attacks the membrane on the back of the retina, and that causes a swelling. You know. So that's, yeah, that's what causes that. So yes, it's all related to that. Oh, that's a good question too. So, what was, what are the, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. What are the symptoms of, of the disease? Um, sometimes you forget things. No, I'm just kidding. Um, um, the uh, some of the common symptoms are mouth sores. Uh, you get what look like boils on your skin that will burst into sores. Um, genital ulcers. Which, you know, if you don't know you have the disease and something like that shows up, then you, you know, just, yeah, you're, you're like, why, how, what, whose hand did I shake, I don't know. Um, and uh, you have, uh, where it gets, I mean, those are serious enough because they hurt. Where it gets really serious, though, is it can attack the lungs, and you can basically, uh, it'll take your lungs out. Um, it can attack your liver, and your eyes, and your brain. You can, you can die of stroke. Um, for me, I've had the eyes, I've had the liver, and as far as the more serious ones, of course, when I was young, the fevers. And looking back on it, we probably had um, issues with the lungs because I had a real, a few years in there where I would have multiple bouts with pneumonia and double pneumonia. And at the time, we thought that's what it was, and what they would do is give me penicillin because I mean, it's the 60s and 70s, everything's penicillin. And they would give me a shot and it wouldn't work. So then they gave me what they, what they love to call the booster shot, which was the adult dose. And I, you know, I'm like eight. And they would give me the adult dose, and that would work. Well, one of the early uh, ways of bringing the symptoms of the shots under control is through megadosing penicillin. So they were doing the right thing and didn't even know they were doing it. So, yeah. <clears throat> and, and I kind of follow up on your question. The disease is considered terminal. They told me um, when, I was, when they diagnosed me at 32 because of the eyes and some other symptoms, they didn't expect me to last longer than five years. So, as I tell everybody, I'm like, I'm 52, so I figure every day I've got me, this is all bonus. <laughs> so, but yeah, that's, that's the disease. Oh, yeah, well, the joints, but yeah. It, it, yes, it, the physical therapy for sedation didn't make a difference. It absolutely made a difference as far as that part of the symptoms. Because what was happening, and the reason I had to quit working, is when the fascia fuses, your muscles don't stretch as much as your skin. And so, like if you're bending like this, when everything's fused, you're pulling your muscles. And so it was like, you know, just standing, walking, it was very painful. It felt like the, my back was on fire the whole time. So by going through the physical therapy, it tore everything loose, and then everything can move again. And so that dropped the pain level, and I could go back to work. What did you do uh, for all your pain for all the years? You know, that's... that's another good question. What did I do for my pain? This is, this is really a good question. So, especially with things going on right now around these medications. So, for me, I, 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 as someone who's been on them a lot, 
and I've been on a lot of different medication over the years. There are, I tell people this all the time, and I don't know how many people agree or disagree, but I, I, and my doctors tend to agree with me on this. I said there's, there's uh, as two types of people to be over, overly simplistic around pain medication. There are those who have addictive personalities and those that don't. I'm one that doesn't, unfortunately, and I'm kind of a control freak about my own life. And so I don't like to feel out of control. So for me, when, if I, when I was taking Vicodin, I didn't like it. I hated it because I didn't like the side effects. I don't, that's just not me. I know the people that had the opposite effect for so it just depends on who you are. Now, for the shits, another interesting kind of side effect of it is, and everybody actually, your bodies will do this, but mine just seems to have, a, have it switched on overdrive. Your body adjusts to medication over time. Everybody's does. But shits will tend to be a little bit quicker. So, like all the opiate-based medication, I can't really take that now. I'm allergic to it, or I'm, I, I don't have a tolerance for it. It'll make me, it actually raises the pain when <coughs> sick. Um, so I take, right now, I take occasionally a muscle relaxer, and, and what, sympathy? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. See, hemp base, I'll take those out. Hemp base CBD oil seems to be helping me so. How are you taking it? How am I taking my CBD? I take it with, uh, in a dropper. It tastes horrible, which is fine. I say medicine should taste horrible. <laughs> But it does seem to be working. Uh, I, I tell you what, after yesterday, we, I, we didn't touch on this much, but yesterday, coming here, we weren't sure we were even going to make it. Uh, our plane was late leaving Charlotte, even though it was the first plane of the day at 6 a.m. due to American Airlines mistakes. And we ended up on a waiting list. We kept getting bumped. And it got, uh, we were supposed to be here before 11, which would give me plenty of time to get here before the traffic. And we ended up basically in a shower driving over the mountain. So we had left, I said, Pacific time, we got up at 12.45 a.m. We were here at 5.30 last night, or yesterday afternoon. So it was a long day. And we flew to Santa Ana and then drove up. And um, so by the end of the day, I was, I was like, we don't want to try the other CBD. <laughs> the pain, and sometimes, I mean, and honestly, really, it's, to me, it's kind of like the old joke where the doctor says, you go to the doctor, it hurts when I do this. He says, don't do this. That's pretty much what I do. You know, if it hurts, that's why I was talking about my riding. It's like when my hands start to cramp up or start to ache, I stop. I mean, that's really about the only thing I can do now. Gary, I have a question. So with, with your disease process, and you said you're only good for about two hours, mm -hmm. how do you keep the momentum? Do you use storybook, storyboard? Do you use outlines? How do you keep it so you're, you can come back into it? Or is it difficult to come back in the momentum? Okay, and that is good. So how do I, how do I ride? I'm only two hours a day home normally. I do use, um, it's kind of funny, so in software, and I, I tell people this all the time, because people will ask me sometimes, how did I get into writing from computers? And I tell them, I said, well, in my head, the way my head works, I said, when I was like, in computers doing development, I was writing for a computer machine that was being used as a medium to people. When I write now, I write to, directly to the human machine, and it's, so we're you know, speaking English as opposed to Java. Um, and so the way I, so I actually use some of my old habits from software. So I have flowcharts. I do use character descriptions, but that's partly because I'm terrible with names at this age. And I've actually forgotten the names of my characters at times. You know, I was sitting there and I'm like, oh, who? and I have to go with, but yeah, so character sheets are great. Um, and the, and the flowcharts, uh, where I'll do a flowchart for a plot outline. And that's really what kind of keeps me going as far as where I need to be. And the other upside is, I am used to working in the old days. I, we work all hours of the day, we work holidays, we work weekends, everything. So for me, I, I tell people, I use my dad's old saying, he used to tell me, uh, make hay when the sun shines, you know, because you have to put hay up when it's dry. And that's kind of my philosophy with how I write. When I feel good, I write. And if I don't feel good, I don't write. So you give yourself permission on days that you don't feel good, which is important to all of us. Yeah, and that was a process. Yeah, it wasn't like that to begin with. I, there was a, uh, early on, I would write and I would kind of try to tough it out and I'd take the muscle relaxer and <clears throat> my hands would bind up for about two days. And that was, I realized that was worse than just taking a break. And, you know, just getting away for a few hours and coming back was better than trying to force, force going longer than I should.
does it help when you have to take those times to actually stop being a writer and turn into a reader and read somebody else's work? Who, who, who inspires you in writing? You know, it's, it's kind of funny. I'm one of those writers that's terrible about reading when I'm writing. But, <laughs> but when I'm not writing, um, I, do, I, we talk, I do like Ted Decker a lot. And the guy is, I, I uh, got to work in the, in the course, I got to work with his creative editor. And I told her, uh, uh, I said, you know, I said, I really, I said, one thing I want to know is how does he put out so many books? And, you know, she was laughing. She's like, oh, he's, I know he's crazy, you know, just, he just does. And, and I do understand, I mean, we, I tell people, I said, if I was healthy, I'd have eight books out already. Because, I mean, once you start going, I mean, it's, you know, you just go. It's not really that hard uh, as far as getting the ideas in your head and writing with them. The hard part's getting the ability to get them out. Uh, but I like him, I like, I was talking uh, this way earlier, the non-books I like as well is that Hitchcock has, has always been a big one for me. I love the storytelling, I love thrillers, I love psychological thrillers, I like a little bit of horror, the old kind, not, not the slashers. Um, <laughs> yeah, and so um, that's, those are really uh, the two Biggest influences. I also liked, um, and this one's kind of way out compared to those two. I like James Benchner. He did a lot of historic fiction. He did the, you know, the, the novels you finished and show your friends look what I read because um, they're so thick. Um, but they were really good. And, and he wrote about areas. I got into him because he wrote. He had a book called Chesapeake. That was one of the first books I read. And I had growing uh, in the summers. Although I grew up out here in the summers, we go to Virginia, and I had an aunt and uncle that lived in Chesapeake, Virginia. And we spent time around that area. And so that book was interesting to me because of the area. And it was fun to read some of the history behind it. And some of it I knew, some of it I didn't. And so yeah, I, I, and I kind of took a twist on his approach to things. Because I'm not really a historical fiction. I don't really want to get that deep into it because I'm more about the characters. But I like using real places. So like I was, uh, this book is, and it, I've been watching fires. Because this book uh, takes place in Malibu. And uh, people ask me, like, well, why did you choose Malibu? You're from Westminster. I'm like, well, because it was Malibu. <laughs> it's a beautiful place, right? It's, and, and the guy owns a defense company. He has a mansion sitting on it and looks down over the, the town and the, and the beach. I'm like, that's why I wrote it there. But I wanted to pick real places in, in the books because, pe you know, we can relate to those. So. Any questions? Uh, just one question. Uh, when you were talking about writing this book, uh, especially when you had this illness, that, that book helped your illness, but you had something to balance on, right? Yeah, that's a good question. Did it help my illness? It, it does at times. Uh, it also, it, they kind of battle each other. Yes. So, yeah, yeah, there are times where, I mean, when my hands start to hurt, it's, it's almost, it is almost comical. I have a twisted sense of humor. It's, it really is kind of almost comical to me because like the hands will start hurting and I'll start missing high beam and whatnot. And my head is like, keep going. <laughs> and so I've got this battle in my brain between like the pain receptors and like the story over here and then just until I finally, you know, eventually I stop. But, uh, but yeah, but, but overall it really is because, and I think my wife will attest to this, it, it does keep me thinking all the other things. I was gonna say it puts me in a better mood, but that's not always true because I, when I'm writing, I have my door closed and she'll come into the office, and I'll just turn around like, I'm ready, go away. <laughs> so I can't raise anything in a better mood. <laughs> but, but, uh, but yeah, it does help. It does help. Yes, Anita? Um, so are you a touch typist? Yes. Alrighty. Yeah, I, I, like, I would say that I thought, yes. So I took typing, and I was like one of maybe two boys back in 1978 or whatever it was. <laughs> that took typing in junior high. And it, we didn't have computers in it. I mean, it was a big deal. We had electric typewriters with, you know, <laughs> the autocorrect, the backspace, right? That was like a major deal back then. Yeah, and, yeah, you know, you didn't have to use whiteout or whatever. And so, but that's, I learned to type. And I also, I played piano when I was younger. And so, I, as I tell people, when I feel like typing, I'm very fast. And so, I, when I'm productive, I'm very productive. Yes. Here. Uh, 
Okay, good question. So the voice activated software, where I never think about taking time to improve that. The problem with voice activated software is there's two, two problems with it. Uh, the, the basis of the software itself is all based on sound waves. So there's only so many ways you can do a sound wave. So the, the biggest headache behind voice activated software is the hardware, your microphone. They've really improved. But you still have, like, you know, sometimes I do this. So you can either have a headset, which is more accurate, or which you get tired of having, like for me, with the fibromyalgia part, if I have some of my head for a half hour, it's like, it's like the Chinese water torture, it's smoothly squeezing. And the others, you have a, a microphone on the desk, and then you're, you know, just have it, you kind of move, and that messes up, and there's nothing you can do for that, really, it's, it's, that's the user. Um, the other piece of it is, and, and Google and some of these other companies are working towards this, but I, personally, I don't think they're working fast enough, and I don't have the physics expertise to do it. Um, although I do have the database expertise. They are gathering more data on people's speech, I mean, part of the problem, of course, is people don't want companies recording what they're saying, but in order to make the software better, you have to record what people are saying to, to get the sound waves that you need and, and your sampling. But that's the other piece of it. And really, like I said, Google, Amazon to some extent, uh, they're making some headway, probably more so than Microsoft. Or uh, and the only really software company out there that's well known and used is Nuance. They have a uh, software called Dragon. It's been around since the 90s. Ironically, when I was at Microsoft, we actually supported them. We had a microphone we built to match up with their software. Yeah. And it's, you know, it, it, that company, I'm not, they, they're okay, but they're, they're the only game in town, and they know it. So, you know, but uh, I think, maybe I'm hoping five years from now, things will be better. But it really is more about, you've got to get a big data set and you, in order to do uh, the improvements that they need to, to get done. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Gary so much. We really appreciate it.